Um, man, I'm really, I'm really humbled. I'm honored that you guys on a Friday night, look at you, on a Friday night, you would come out to listen to some guy talk about geeky constitution stuff and who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. Oh, be careful. Last time we did this, the guy turned into the center of Mike Lee. So just be careful. <laughs> you know, pe people have asked me that, and I said, you know what? Well, you'll hear more as we go along. We solve the problem here in Utah or we don't solve the problem. <coughs> Washington, we need good people in Washington. We have to have good people in Washington. But as you'll see, and we'll talk about some things that are going on there, um, if we don't solve the problem here, we don't solve the problem. My, my objective tonight is not to give a nice speech. My, my objective tonight is that you understand that you are the government and that you will make the difference as to whether or not we in Utah are able to stand as the model of what it means to be self-reliant and free to the United States of America. Because I believe that's our obligation. I believe that's our stewardship. I believe that's our duty. And I believe we have a unique ability to do that unlike any other state in the United States. I'm really thrilled that these young folks are here. I'm going to talk to you most of the time. Because uh, these old guys, they, you know, you're going to be pushing us in the wheelchair and take care, taking care of us soon enough. But, but thank you for being here. Um, I hope I don't put you to sleep. My daughter, I did a fireside Sunday night. And my daughter said, Dad, you know how firesides, after about 15 or 30 minutes, you feel like you want to die? She said, you talked for about an hour, and I never felt like I wanted to die once. So I, I took that as really high praise. Um, when I ran, I told people that I was running in the dad party because I was as frustrated with my Republican leaders in Washington that were spending my children's future at a rate that's, that's unfathomable. Um, and looking at what we have to do, I'm, I'm in this for my kids. That, that, that's why I'm here. That, that's the only reason I'm here. I'd much rather go buy 10 acres and grow carrots and raise chickens and we actually had the plan to do that, and I was asked to moderate the first Senate debate a year ago. It was almost a year ago right now, with Mike Lee and Cheryl and the others. And we actually had a piece of property, a really nice piece of property picked out. We were picking out the carrot seeds, and my wife was looking into chickens. And, and uh, after, that, uh, after that debate and the issues and the things that are, we understand, which is why you're all here on a Friday night, at the end of that debate, my wife said, we're not buying the farm, are we? I'm like, no, we're not. We have work to do. We have work to do. We all have work to do. Uh, first, the first candidate training I went to, Salt Lake County candidate training, I stood up. And they said, they said uh, stand up, tell us your name, tell us why you're running. And they went around, they got to me, and I stood up. I said, I'm Ken Ivory, and I'm running to secure the blessings of liberty to my posterity. And there were three or four in the room that kind of chuckled. And, and after the meeting, there was uh, kind of the old, some of the old guard that had been in office for a while, not guys like John Dougal, not guys like Morgan Philpott, but some of the old guys that had been there for a while came up to me afterwards, and they, 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 they had to take it upon themselves to educate me. They said, listen, son, you, you don't understand. You have to get elected first. You can't say that stuff. And... Uh, he said, you can't, you can't say that stuff. You've got to get elected first. You've got to go out and find out what the people want to hear. You've got to tell them that, and you've got to get elected first. And I'll tell you, I went home that night. And I almost gave up before I started. I went home, and I kind of fell in bed next to my wife. I said, honey, I can't do this. I can't, I can't do this. I, I, I'm running because I see some very definite things that we need to do for our future, I see some things that we have to just put our common sense glasses back on. And if people don't want to hear that, well, this is what we have to do. And I can't go tell them something else because this is what we have to do. And, and I would just, oh, I, I just, I can't tell you how, how despondent I felt. And I talked to some people helping me on the campaign, and some of them are here. And they said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's figure out the flyer. Let's figure out the message. It's okay to throw some of that state sovereignty stuff in there, but you know, talk about education, talk about the economy, and if you have to, then talk about some of that state sovereignty stuff. And so we put some of our flyers together and got working for the convention and all that stuff and going out to talk to the delegates. And if you've been around me, John will tell you, I mean, I default to this 
all the time. It's all I think about. It's all I read, read about. It's all I study. Um, I didn't know you knew anything else. That's it's about <laughs> it. Um, so I'm out talking to the delegates, and and we default every time. Every house with the delegates, every doorstep we went to, I had a I had a, a message on my flyer, a little saying on my flyer. Alexander Hamilton, he's the big government guy, right? Alexander Hamilton, and even he says we may safely rely on the disposition of our state legislatures to erect barriers against the encroachments of the national authority. And when we were talking to Republicans and Democrats and independents, and we talk about 70% of our land, Morgan was talking about, 70% of our land is controlled by the federal government, as if we would mess it up if we controlled our own land. In our schools, we have, we have mandates from the federal government and from the state that you're talking about. Mandates down to our teachers that handcuff our principals, <coughs> teachers, and parents in educating those children that they know best and love most. And, and so we talk about those things, and I was getting amens from the whole choir, not just one side of the choir. It's like, we know how to do these things. We know how to deal with these things. Um, you, you, you may have heard a couple weeks ago probably two or three weeks ago in the newspaper, you probably heard about Rebecca Ford. She's a special education teacher out in Tooele. Been a special education teacher out there for years. And she decided with her unique children in her unique community that, that they were going to develop a bake sale program. I see a lot of heads nodding. It's unbelievable. You can't make this stuff up. You just can't. She was going to develop a bake sale program for her unique children. And so they would go out and they would help pick what they were going to make, they would help make the food, they would package the food and price the food, and then they got to get out with the general population of students and sell the food and interact. They'd account for the money and save some to reinvest to go forward, and then they used the proceeds for some of their programs. Well, also just a couple of weeks ago, we now have a new law, federal law. You guys can write this story yourself, right? A new law that the secretary of the FDA is now going to decide. I'm sure he doesn't even know how to pronounce Tooele. <laughs> Tooley, right? He's going to say Tooley, Utah. Secretary of the FDA is going to decide now whether Mrs. Ford and her unique children in her unique community can have a bake sale. Where's the line is the question. If they can do that, what can't they do? If, as Morgan was talking about, Ken Salazar with the stroke of a pen, I was in the meeting where the governor was describing this, and the governor said he got a call at 11 o'clock in the morning on December 23rd. He got a call from, from the director of the BLM. He said, Governor, I just want to let you know that uh, Secretary Salazar is going to have a press conference at noon. He's going to announce this new policy where we're just going to designate lands as wild lands. No congressional de de declaration, no congressional action. We're just going to do that. And the governor said, well, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. On uh, December 23rd, everybody's gone out of the office. Is there anything I can say that will make any difference? I said, no, just want to let you know. So then this, uh, this director of the BLM came out a couple weeks ago. It was last Friday, right? It was just last Friday. He came out to face the people in Utah. Mike Noel was, was hilarious. He said, you know, I want to congratulate you on your courage to come out here and come to this state after you've taken our lands, you've demeaned our people, you've been as condescending as you can be. I want to commend you on your courage. <laughs> but the thing that he said over and over again, repeatedly in that meeting, I'm sure he didn't even realize how condescending it sounded, but he said it repeatedly just like this. He said, we manage your public lands for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're obviously not smart enough. We'd ruin them by ourselves, right? That's where, how did we get here? How did we get here? Is that our system? Is that who we are? Is that what this nation is? You guys know about the Battle of Brooklyn? Battle of Brooklyn, right? So July 4th, 1776 is the Declaration of Independence. Battle of Brooklyn happens in August. Just barely getting started. Washington is still trying to, I mean, they would had battles and skirmishes and things before the Declaration, but this is really the first big battle. And you have, you have Lord Admiral Howe amasses 450 of the best equipped, most magnificent warships that existed in the world, in the history of the world to that point. 450 warships 
are in the harbor off Long Island. Washington had all of his troops on Manhattan. And General Howe, the Lord Admiral's good brother, was on Long Island with his troops getting ready to sally forth and come up against the, uh, these rebels, these upstarts with pitchforks and farmers and taking on the most well-equipped army in the world. They had no business doing that. They had no business doing that. They set up some, some, some garrisons and thought they could fire across the East River and, and, and if they tried to, to, to run the ships up and off came Admiral Howe up the river with a couple of his ships and it was like they had pea shooters. They're trying to shoot at their ships and they just moved right up the East River as if there was nothing even happening. No, 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 no defense to them at all. And off they went and up they go to the river to just kind of surround and take control of everything. Well, Washington decides he needs to move his whole army to the Brooklyn Heights. And off they go, and they're up on the Brooklyn Heights, and, 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 and uh, General Howe's on Long Island. And, and Washington had secured all the passes, they thought. But you know, at that time, they had the Loyalists, they had the Patriots, and then they had those that could care less. Sounds kind of familiar, right? Well, there was a particular pass, the Jamaica Pass, that they didn't, they didn't guard. And one of the Loyalists kind of disclosed to to General Howe, hey, this is unguarded. It's a little past, but they, they left it unguarded. And, and General Howe comes in, and through the night, they start bringing their troops through the Jamaica Pass and get in around and to the point that they can kind of surround Washington. And as day broke, they came and just started letting the slaughter fly. And all day long, they started slaughtering Washington's troops until they had pinned them back up against the Brooklyn Heights toward the end of that day. And, and it's amazing. It's amazing what happened. At the end of that day, General Howe gets here. He's got him pinned up against the Brooklyn Heights, and he says, you know what? I'll kill him in the morning. This is too easy. We, we, we beat him on the first day, basically. And they kind of set back, and they're just going to wipe him out in the morning. I guess they'll expect that they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, uh, surrender. And at that night, Washington has some of his prime troops creating a diversion in the front lines, and they're trying to figure out what are they going to do. This is Washington, one of Washington's first real tests. What are they going to do? I mean, here, it's over before it even started. I mean, all the effort, and we pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor, and within a month, it's over. One of the things that had stopped Admiral Howe from continuing to advance his ships up the East River was what some of them called a divine wind, kind of like the kamikaze in Japanese fame. This wind came down the East River and just pinned Admiral Howe. He'd gotten two ships up, but he pinned the rest of them out in the harbor. Couldn't, couldn't advance. It was just, it couldn't even move up. Washington happened to have some of the best seamen in his troops in, in, the, in the American armies. He had those New Englanders that were just those scrappy New Englanders. And they said, we can get all the boats we can get and we'll row across the East River all night long. I understand in military maneuvers, some of you probably know this much better than I do, but that a retreat is probably the most difficult maneuver to execute. But they decided upon this. The problem with a retreat is if you get halfway into it and they discover what's going on, not only do you have half your troops in the river and you wipe them out, you've got the other half there not able to defend themselves tremendously. It requires complete secrecy, loyalty, fidelity to execute that maneuver. So all night long they start. And they've got these northeasterners on their boats just rowing them across the East River. They get to the morning, they've only got half their army across. And the sun's about to rise. As the sun starts to rise, a fog so dense you couldn't see your hand in front of your face settles over the Brooklyn Heights. And they continued to retreat and row their army across the East River until they got every last man. You had the, you had the ones on the edge banging, I don't know if they banged pots, banging something, lighting fires, creating a diversion to make the, the appearance of having their full army out on the front lines. Finally had them to retreat, got all of their army over to Manhattan, and the fog lifts. Now, many people would ascribe that to a coincidence. Luck. They did not. They said it was the miraculous hand of God that had preserved them. Let me share with you something. And, and 